Good afternoon, everybody. It's David Perlmutter from Quantum Listing, and welcome to our webinar, Planning and Utilizing Tax Strategies for Real Estate Professionals. And we are joined today by Kent Fitzpatrick of Charles River Financial Group up in Massachusetts. And I am going to let Julia do the introduction of Kent because Julia was the one who was clever enough to uh, bring him into the tent today. Uh, Julia, for those of you that haven't had the pleasure of talking with her yet, is the customer success manager here at Quantum Listing, and uh, Kent is a longtime family friend of Julia's family which is also my family. Uh, and Julia, I'm going to throw it to you now. All right. Thanks, David. Um, like David said, we're so excited to have Kent on the webinar today. Um, not only does he have a superb background in uh, finance, financial planning, investments, you name it, he also has a real estate background. Um, and we are really excited to introduce him if you don't mind going to the next slide, David. So Kent Fitzpatrick is an accredited investment fiduciary analyst from the Center for Fiduciary Studies, a global financial steward and a certified behavioral finance analyst. He is a registered representative of Concord Investment Services. He's the founder, managing director, and an investment advisor representative of Asset Strategy Advisors, as well as regional director and an investment advisor representative of Asset Strategy Consultants. He's also the founder, president, and a licensed insurance representative of Charles River Financial, which is his independent financial advisory firm of over 30 years. So he has 30 years of experience, over 30 years, in financial planning estate planning, and providing investment advice. As a founding principal of both ASA and CRF, his focus includes oversight of a team providing comprehensive, customized investment advisory services, as well as counseling clients on asset allocation, investment strategies, risk management, fiduciary consulting, and participant outcomes. Kent's a past president of retirement advisors and Designers of America, and a former board member of InvestNet Retirement Solutions, a graduate of St. Anselm College with a bachelor's in economics. Ken also holds a certificate in fiduciary governance from the Thunderbird Walker Center for Global Entrepreneurship. He also holds the Financial Industry Regulatory Authority Series 6, 7, 24, and 63 licenses. In addition to that, he also has real estate and insurance licenses. So with a background that long that I'm out of breath, I cannot wait for Kent to take it from here. And like David said, um, Kent's not only a wonderful person to do work with, but also a wonderful person himself. Um, I'm 24 and I think I've known him for over uh, 20 of those 24 years. So um, Kent, are you ready? I am ready, yeah. Okay. I'm going, All right. I'm going to turn over the presenter role to you, Kent. Great. Thank you. <clears throat> All right. Um, can you see my screen? Yes, uh, you can. David and Julie? Yep. Thanks. All right, great. Um, well, I'm going to uh, jump right into it in the interest of time. Um, you know, knowing that our audience uh, uh, probably is very experienced and familiar with 1031. Um, what I'm going to do is just maybe level set and, and just give a little background overview with that. Uh, but I want to dive into to two other areas uh, which uh, talk about fractional ownership through Delaware Statutory Trust and also the new regu regulations under Opportunity Zones. Um, so with that, um, you know, again, uh, my assumption is that many people are familiar with 1031. We've, we've worked with a number of, of brokers um, attorneys, CPAs, uh, folks in and related to the, the real estate business, and uh, I've, I've heard time and time again, Kent, gee, I've been practicing for 30 years. I'm, I'm, you know, very familiar with 1031, 
but was never familiar with some of these other areas that, that we'll talk about in just a minute. So maybe um, just a quick uh, background. Again, 1031 is basically uh, the ability to recognize no gain or loss uh, for an exchange of real property. And one thing on this slide you'll note that came out of the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act um, from uh, December 22nd of 2017 was that it removed personal property and so, so it's now just real property. And also out of that same um, tax bill uh, was the formation of opportunity uh, zones, which we'll, we'll cover in just a little bit. Uh, but also for maybe a little background or history, so 1031s date back to, to 1921. So it, it's, it's been a, a, you know, a law of the land for exchanging uh, appreciated property for a number of years. Um, and I think that um, a, a little history or timeline, uh, in 2002, uh, the first form of, of fractional ownership being recognized as a allowable uh, property in, in the form of a 1031 exchange uh, came uh, out of what was known as TICs or tenants in common. Um, in 2002, those, those were a little bit problematic uh, because they it was recourse debt, there was a limited number of investors, uh, you know, when the markets changed, there was a lot of infighting and lawsuits. Uh, so in 2004, from uh, Revenue Ruling uh, 2004-86, uh, Delaware st Statutory Trusts, or I'll refer to it throughout this conversation as DSTs, um, were introduced, and, and that was really to address some of the problems with the original uh, tenant in common um, structure. We'll talk about that a little bit further. Um, also to the, added to the timeline, um, Section 121 uh, exclusion was added in, in 2005, and if, if you recall, that's basically the personal residence exemption where you have $250,000 per person or, or, or $500,000 uh, per per couple uh, for avoidance of, of ga uh, gain on, on selling a personal residence. Uh, some of us on the call that it were around during the Great Recession in real estate of 2005 through, through 2009, I cite that here because I think um, you'll, you'll see that um, the, the fractional ownership marketplace using DSTs really didn't take uh, take flight until around 2012 after some of the market uh, volatility. But so what are some of these taxes that we're talking about that we're able to um, defer uh, by, by ex executing a 1031 exchange? Um, well, there's several. Uh, and I think some folks are familiar with the, the federal capital gains um, at either the 15 or 20 percent rate uh, if if uh, my income exceeds for, for that uh, for 2019, uh, 488,000 as a couple or 434,000 as a single filer, um, I'd be in the 20% bracket. Um, and what people need to also understand, it's not just ordinary income, but the capital gain is factored in. So if I'm selling appreciated real estate, it very quickly uh, can be north of the you know the 434,000 or 48 a figure. Um, so the Fed tax is generally in the 20% bracket. State is going to depend state by state. You know, I'm up here in Massachusetts, it's 5.2%. I know New York City is 12.7, California is 13.3. So that's really state by state, whether there's a, a state uh, capital gains tax. Um, one that a lot of people are not familiar with are these next two, which is the 3.8%, sometimes referred to as o o Obama tax or Medicaid tax. It's really the net investment income tax. Um, which is at 3.8%, uh, and then the final kind of gotcha tax is a 25% um, depreciation recapture. Um, and I, I've noted here that really you want to uh, take a look at the uh, the client's Schedule E because the accountant will have kept track of all the, the basis and depreciation throughout the years, um, so the Schedule E, it will be very important. But when you look at all of these different taxes, very quickly, um, you know, you'll see that, it, that that can amount to well in excess of a, of a, of a third uh, of, the, of the gain. Um, so what is motivating doing an exchange? Well, several that I pointed out here, uh, you know, maybe it, it could be uh, better cash flows. Maybe I bought an, an, a piece of vacant land as an investment property and I, I'm not getting any income off of it. Um, you know, maybe I want to uh, diversify and, and, and be in other markets or other asset uh, categories. Um, maybe it's a, it's, a, it's a joint ownership. I bought a, a uh, investment property with a with a partner and we want to kind of go our own separate ways uh, so th there's any number of reasons why we'd want to execute a 1031 and, and avoid those those taxes we just talked about um, the types of properties um, you could see we listed here retail apartments single family raw land 
industrial property, commercial property. So uh, another misnomer on the 1031 is if I own a, a, a three-family income property that I have to exchange it for another multifamily. Well, that's, that's not true. It's like-kind property um, is, is intended for the use of, uh, of, of, of business uh, investment purposes. Um, and it has to, it can be anywhere in the United States or its possessions, which would include Puerto Rico, Guam, and some other possessions of, of, of uh, the United States. So like-kind property means basically for the intent of, of, of investment purposes. Um, we get asked this question a lot about uh, vacation homes and second, second homes, so I wanted to just include two quick slides uh, on this. And, and again, the intent here, um, I can have a, uh, a vacation home, but the, but the intent must be for, for, for profit. Um, it doesn't say that I have to derive income, because go back to my uh, vacant land example, but it has to be set up and derived for profit. Um, and there also is a, a limitation uh, on the amount of personal use that I can have. Um, so let's say that, for example, I own a three family and I'd like to buy a place down the beach, um, but you know, in, in, at some point, maybe in the future, I want to use that for my personal residence. Well, you know, a great opportunity to exchange that uh, three family for a, a rentable income property down on the shore and then convert it at some point down the line. And so the, the way that the rules read is I need to own the property for, for 24 months prior to the exchange. Um, it has to be rented for at least 14 uh, days per year. Um, and, the, and this is the, the key thing is the personal use limitation which it can, it's the greater of 14 days or 10% of the days rented. And I'll, I'll give you a quick example of that. So let's say in my, my beach house example, if, if I rent that property for, for 10 months out of the year, let's, or let's say uh, 300 days, then I would be able to use 10% of, the, of that period. So 10% of 300 would be 30 days. Uh, does not have to be consecutive. So essentially I could get up to one month of personal use if that equals the 10% of time. So I think a lot of folks assume that, you know, I'm limited to the 14 days. That doesn't count uh, any betterments or improvements if I'm down there painting a bedroom or something like that. Um, but I think it's worth worth mentioning um, because I think this gets very creative in terms of what types of properties you look at for exchanging. Uh, so again, uh, some of the other basic rules I want to cover. Um, really, you, you, there's, there's really four. Um, you want to exchange equal or greater um, so if, if you exchange, uh, you, you have both equity and debt in an exchange, and you want to uh, always trade across, meaning e even for debt, even for equity, or up. Um, you, you need to reinvest all the proceeds. Um, if, I, if I fail any of these uh, quite criteria, I'm going to create what's called boot, uh, which basically would, would create a taxable situation. Um, Again, debt for debt, uh, I need an equal exchange. And the last one here, I received no, no monies. Um, one last point I'll make on this slide is that um, boot is not necessarily proportional. I've had a lot of people say, well, I'm selling a place you know, for two million bucks. I'm gonna take a half million bucks off the table and do something with it. And so I assume I'll just you know, pay a you know, proportional amount in, in taxes or boot. Well, that's, that's not necessarily the case. So I always tell people that they need to calculate you know, any scenarios where they're going to take money off the table. Uh, so just a very quick, simplistic example here. Uh, so if I'm selling a property um, for uh, $750,000, uh, I'm using the example here, net, you know, minus any, you know, closing, that's net of any closing costs. Uh, I have a $200,000 mortgage and I have 550000 in this example of equity. Um, I'm buying a new property for eight twenty five, dollars provided I'm, I'm replacing equity for equity, and, and debt for debt equal or greater, then there would be no tax on that type of exchange. Um, and this is just a, a, a brief list of some of the types of closing costs that are, are not um, considered, uh, that are taken out of, you know, they're netted out of the, uh, the exchange. So commissions, title insurance, uh, escrow fees, recording fees, et cetera. And by the way, if, if anyone has, um, any uh, questions as we're going through this? You know, as I said, I, we have a bunch of material to kind of power through, but you can enter a question on the uh, the GoToMeeting uh, panel. Um, so uh, again, just this, you know, kind of revisiting the, the basic rules of 1031. Um, so the timelines are: I have 45 days to identify 
an exchangeable property, like-kind property, and I have 180 days to close. And, and it, there, that is basically from the time I've relinquished the property. Two important things here. One is if I'm going to sell a property and I want to enter into an exchange, I need to involve a, a QI or a qualified intermediary because I cannot take constructive receipt of the proceeds of the sale. And a lot of folks don't realize that my attorney or CPA cannot act as a, as a QI or a qualified intermediary. It has to be a disinterested party. Um, and, and it's certainly well worth engaging um, a, uh, a qualified intermediary you know, the, from one of the larger organizations that has the experience because there's a lot of paperwork um, to keep the transaction um, all, all, all above board. So 45 days to identify, 180 days uh, to close. Um, on that exchange, there's basically three rules. Um, the three property rule, uh, which basically I can identify up to, up to three properties or a, a DST, as we we'll talk about in a moment, um, of unlimited value, or uh, the 200% rule, which I, if, I, if I want to exceed three properties, I can't exceed 200% of what I'm exchanging. Um, and the third, uh, which I don't find used as common in the marketplace is the 95% rule, which basically says, it, you know, if I blow the three property rule or the 200% the rule, then I can identify as, as many properties as I want, but I have to buy up to 95% of them. So most folks I, I, that we work with will live within the uh, three property rule or the 200% rule. Uh, so just a quick um, example here. In this example, we're using a million dollar gain with a hundred thousand dollar basis. Um, and we'll kind of walk through the, the, the four taxes that we talked about. So the first one, the depreciation recapture, that's the 25%. So 25% of my basis of a hundred thousand dollars is 25 grand. The federal tax, um, the federal tax really is, is the two pieces. It's both the, uh, the 20 percent capital gains, but it also factors in that Medicare or net investment income tax. So it's 20 percent on, on the adjusted amount. So it's 20 percent of 900, not on, on the million. So it's 180,000. In the, this example, we're using state capital gains, the national average being 6.1 percent. It may be different in your state, so that's 61,000. And then the net investment income or Obamacare tax. Uh, 3.8%. So, in this simple example, you know, very quickly, it's in excess of 30% of, of, of the of the gain. Um, so, why are we kind of focusing on and talking about um, real estate? Well, commercial real estate uh, or income property actually represents a very meaningful a, a portion of, of high net worth investors' uh, overall investment holdings. And um, a, in, in a study, it showed that 58% of high net worth investors have more than 10% of assets allocated to commercial real estate. And of that, 79% um, hold commercial real estate allocation in, in direct real estate. So we'll, we'll kind of change gears. Um, and I think with the aging population and the dramatic increase in, in real estate values, um, you know, people are looking for different ways of diversifying their, not just their investment portfolio, stocks and bonds, but even their real estate portfolio. Um, so this decision tree may help kind of give a visual roadmap. So at the top of the tree here, I'm, I'm a decision is to, to sell my property. I, I have two courses of, of pa pass. I can either one, pay all the taxes we talked about, uh, or two, I can enter into a 1031 exchange. If I do that, then I need to engage the, the qualified intermediary. I have that, that the 45 day and 180 day uh, timelines to, to enact the exchange. And then I really have two other courses of action. Um, I can either uh, purchase uh, uh, what I, we, we refer to as active real estate or hands-on real estate, um, or I can take a passive approach uh, using a Delaware Statutory Trust. Um, now, the Delaware Statutory Trust is a securitized form of real estate, as I, as I mentioned, that the IRS allowed going back to 2004. Um, and we'll talk about what it means to, to, to qualify as a qualified in investor. So. You know, someone that may have been a, a landlord for many, many years, um, you know, they they may not want to be a hands-on landlord, or maybe in in some cases we we worked with uh, brokers where they are buying a new piece of property and they use a Delaware statutory trust to kind of soak up the uh, the, the differential if they're they're not buying up equal amounts to avoid avoid boot. Um, so, talking a little bit more about Delaware statutory trusts or, or DSTs. Um, so uh, it really is a professionally uh, managed 
um, multiple income producing commercial property, um, investors would receive their, their prorated share of income, uh, tax benefits, and any capital appreciation uh, by the real estate without the direct management responsibilities. Um, so the DST itself holds title to the properties while multiple investors own beneficial interests in the DST. Um, and as I mentioned before, it, it's non-recourse debt if there's any debt on uh, from the DST sponsor. Um, for tax purposes, each DST investor is treated as owning an undivided fractional interest in the real estate. Um, and uh, essentially, there's a, a tax reporting form of um, uh, 8824 that's used really for any any 1031 exchange. So I mentioned that this is a securitized form of, of real estate, um, which uh, because it's not a uh, as liquid as a, a stock or a bond, um, it falls under what's called uh, Reg D uh, of, of uh, the security exchange uh, codes. And so they require that an investor um, meet the accredited investor requirements and it's not for general solicitation. So, so that what that means is someone has to have a net worth of at least a million dollars exclusive of their primary residence um, or uh, income exceeding $200,000 um, a year for each of the last two years or $300,000 uh, if they file with, with a spouse. So what are some of the potential benefits of, of using a DST in, the, in an exchange? Well, number one, it's, it's all about tax deferral, um, deferring both the federal and, and, and state taxes on the sale of the investment property. Um, similar to a, a, a regular 1031 into physical real estate, um, the heirs, uh, there's some tax forgiveness because heirs would still receive a, a step up in basis um, at, at death. Um, it's also a way of acquiring you know, higher quality investment grade properties um, that maybe a small investor uh, would not be able to attain or afford to purchase on, on their own directly. Um, it's also a way of, of, of diversifying risk with, with different asset classes and different geographic locations. Um, and there's also uh, lower minimums. So uh, some of the sponsors have programs that would allow investors as low as, you know, 25 to $50,000. Um, it's a, it's a form of hassle free investing. Um, sometimes uh, we've heard the expression mailbox money because they're getting regular monthly or quarterly distributions. Um, the marketplace right now for Delaware Statutory Trust is typically somewhere in the five to seven percent range, um, as well as uh, appreciation when the when the properties are, are sold on on top of that. Um, and as I mentioned before, uh, it also can be a way of of using a, a debt replacement uh, on an exchange. Um, the marketplace uh, for uh, securitized uh, 1031s um, is uh, approaching about three billion dollars. Uh, this, this slide um, is, is through the, the first half of, of 2019. Um, there are approximately 38 sponsors of uh, DST, some of the major names that some of you may be familiar with, uh, Inland, Pasco, Cantor Fitzgerald, uh, Blue Rock, Highland. Um, the average deal size uh, this past year has been about a $30 million capital raise. Again, investing in the, the properties we, we talked about, multifamily, student housing, industrial, um, uh, or triple net leases. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's a growing industry. And as I mentioned, it really was after the uh, kind of the recessionary period when you know, real estate took off that we've seen the uh, resurgence of this, this marketplace. Um, so this gives a breakdown of, of what types of assets. Uh, so predominantly, in this sector, uh, it's uh, multifamily. Um, uh, it's the, the, certainly by far the biggest uh, market share and um, the d dollars raised year to date. Uh, in terms of where are these types of uh, 1031 DSTs, uh, most of them are in what I call the sand states or maybe the smile states, kind of the uh, perimeter. And a lot of it is driven by um, job growth and demographics. Um, so, you know, you look at places like Florida and, and, and Texas, uh, you know, we, we are in a, a very high cap area up in New England and New York and Southern California. So you don't see as many uh, programs because the cap rates, the, the return to investors just isn't as attractive. And with, with jobs growth and demographic shifts uh, going to some of the, the sand states, um, that's where a lot of these um, programs, um, sponsors, um, offer. Um, 
we have a piece that we put together. Um, just to take a moment here. If, if any of you on the call want a copy of this, you can just uh, use this uh, text. Um, uh, the number to text to is 44222. If you text the word top 10 RE, uh, you can download a copy of, of this uh, PDF. Um, I'm going to share a couple of quick ideas on why uh, brokers or real estate professionals um, may want to consider how this complements their, their business and may help, help close um, more business by being what I would uh, uh, say more consultative and understanding some of the tax uh, impacts uh, and to help in the exchange. So if you text top 10 RE to 44222, um, I'll pull out just a couple of examples from, from this handout. Um, the, the first example we give is, um, which many of you on the call may have uh, run into, is what we call the reluctant seller, um, you know, where someone is basically looking at, you know, listing their, their property, whether it's a multifamily or a strip mall or a triple net property, uh, and they obviously want to get the, the most f uh, for their, their, their dollar, uh, but they're also looking at you know they're paying um, you know broker fees and they also are going to pay you know an enormous amount in taxes and as we we talked about you know quickly eating up upwards of 30 percent well if you can present a solution that allows them to mitigate or eliminate the uh, the tax um, they're probably a lot um, more receptive to selling a property at a, at a at a reasonable rate versus an unreasonable rate if their their net um, is going to be a, a lot higher um, and I, I mentioned before the idea of the downside exchanger, where if if someone is selling a property and they, they want to buy a new property that's of, of lesser value and it's not um, equal debt or an equal equity, um, you can use a DST to, to, to soak up the differential to again to, to avoid avoid boot. Um, one of the questions that uh, came up on the uh, screen uh, was how liquid are, are investments in DSTs? Um, DSTs, um, one of the protections that came out in a DST is that it does not allow the sponsor to, to refinance debt. Um, so most of the, the deals, have, if they have debt on the property, have 10-year uh, paper on it. So a DST cannot outlive uh, the, the, the debt. So um, most of the properties or, or, or sponsors in the marketplace uh, I would typically say that the, the life cycle is uh, five to seven years uh, because they're investors in the uh, in the assets alongside of you. Um, so they typically are, are it's a value add play, and it, which is a little bit different than we'll talk about in a minute with opportunity funds, which those are all uh, ground up uh, development. Um, so usually five to seven years is when they're looking to, to, to turn the property. Um, in the interest of time, I will. Uh, kind of uh, advanced through some of these slides and jump jump into um, opportunity zones. You might hear uh, these referred to as uh, QOZs, Qualified Opportunity Zones, or QOFs, Qualified Opportunity Funds. Um, you know, the, kind of interchangeable, but hopefully I'll, I'll clarify a little bit of that for you today. Um, a study from uh, Real Capital Analytics um, said that opportunity zones account for 10% of, of all uh, investable land sites, which is a pretty staggering statistic. Um, I want to start by giving you a little background on um, opportunity zones and then give you a little bit of timeline to, to bring you up to speed on, on where we're at uh, with, with those zones. Um, so the, really the idea started from uh, Sean Parker, who some of you may recall was the original founder of, of, of Napster, and I'm probably dating myself now because that was the one of the original music sharing platforms. I don't know if uh, Julia would, would would know that, but or not. But um, and then he was also one of the original uh, presidents of uh, Facebook. So you can imagine through those uh, entrepreneurial efforts, um, when he was looking to liquidate and sell stock, he was going to be um, extremely patriotic. Let's put it that way, in terms of what capital gains uh, he would be facing. Uh, so he had um, a, a think group, a think tank group that he uh, uh, underwrote called the Economic Innovation Group, uh, which was really uh, where the, the genesis of this um, idea came from. Um, and it was really about uh, how can we take you know gains and, and, and do good with it. Uh, they're not going to name a, a battleship after you when you uh, pay your tax bill. Um, and, and it really got momentum when it was a bipartisan. Um, initiative by uh, uh, Tim Scott, who was a uh, Republican out of South Carolina, 
and Cory Booker, a Democrat out of North uh, New Jersey, uh, kind of uh, took this idea and were able to get it added to the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act uh, that was signed December 22nd of 2017, and this became law uh, on, on January 1st of, of 2018. So if you follow my my, my timeline here, um, well, but I guess before I do that, so the idea was to provide um, tax incentives for long-term investment in low-income and economically distressed areas. And, and these areas are, are home to about 50 million uh, Americans. Um, so uh, it seems that, okay, that's, that's almost uh, coming up on two years. So, so what, what's happened? Why is it taking so long? Well, really, what, what happened in the beginning of 2008, they, they needed to have each uh, governor uh, determine, you know, what areas of their, their state would be eligible for these designations as, as qualified opportunity zones. That was all based upon the 2010 um, census, um, and the governors were able to identify up to 25% um, of these low-income um, areas uh, as opportunity zones. Um, the, that went um, um, on record June 14th of 2018, and so there's 8,762 of these zones scattered all over the country, uh, in, including uh, District of Columbia and, and, and uh, U.S. possessions. Most of Puerto Rico, by the way, is an opportunity zone, if not all of Puerto Rico. Um, so so the, the, the footprint was defined, uh, but there was still a lot of questions for the IRS. How does this work and, and, and so forth? So there was a hearing October 19th of 2018 where they put together uh, some proposed regulations and, and kind of expanded on what the, uh, the, the, the law was all about. Unfortunately, uh, like a lot of things in government, there was still a lot of gray areas. Um, so there was a hearing uh, proposed January 10th of this year, 2019. And if you recall back, uh, the government was closed on January 10th of 2019. Um, so someone um, suggested that the hearing be postponed till February 14th, uh, Valentine's Day. Uh, and so really it was when those um, regulations were finalized after the hearing on April 17th of this year, so just a few months back, um, that a lot of sponsors um, of, of qualified opportunity funds uh, really took flight uh, because a lot of the uh, unknowns were, were clarified. Now, you'll see I have a couple other dates in the future here, 2026, which I'll show you on our timeline. Uh, so this regulation allows you to de defer taxes for seven years or to, to the uh, end of 2026, um, I get to reduce my taxes, which I'll show you on the next uh, slide. Uh, and then uh, ultimately, if I hold it for um, a, a full 10 year period, so in this example, 2028, um, the end of 2028, then I would pay no tax on the new investment. The reason 2047 is shown on the screen uh, is that is when the the, the law uh, will ultimately sunset. So if, so if I haven't sold my qualified opportunity fund by 2047, I will, will have missed out on all the, the, the tax benefits we'll cover in a moment. So again, it was a bipartisan bill. It, it's, it's etched in stone. The, the zones are, are committed. There's no modifications to that. Um, and uh, we're now in a, a stage where the funds are being created. So um, I've included a, a, a national map showing a lot of these uh, geographic areas, but I would encourage you all to take a look at the, uh, the map on your computer in the upper right-hand corner, eig.org forward slash opportunity zones. You can actually put in an, in a, an address, you can put in a, a neighborhood, a town, and it'll give you the uh, specific um, footprint of the, of the zones. Um, so keep in mind, I said that this, this was all defined and based upon census data going back to uh, 2010. So that's now nine years ago. So a lot of these areas um, have, have gentrified. And so these are not necessarily destitute areas. Um, these are up and coming areas in, in, in many cases. Um, so I'm gonna just move to a, a slide uh, that will kind of re revisit. So the, the, basically I'm getting a, a tax deferral so I can take any capital gain. So unlike a 1031, um, which is only uh, transference of, of real property or, or you know, real estate, um, with an ozone, I basically get a second bite of the apple. Uh, I, I can take any capital gain. So if it's the selling of my Bitcoin or my stamp collection or my, my real estate, and maybe I screwed up my real estate transaction and I didn't have a, a QI or the, the replacement property fell through, 
um, this gives you a, another bite of the apple. You have a, a similar 180 day period that you do in a 1031 um, to execute uh, uh, on a qualified opportunity fund. Um, so if I take that gain, I reinvest it in a qualified opportunity fund within 180 days, um, I get to defer the taxes uh, and I get to reduce the taxes. If I hold it in that fund for five years, I get a 10% reduction in the taxes that would be due. If I hold it for two additional years or seven years in total, I get a 15% break. Um, that um, seven years uh, is going to go away at the end of this calendar year. So uh, after January 1st, the tax incentive will, will drop to 10% from a 15% break. Um, after that seven-year period, I do pay those, those reduced taxes, so 85 cents on the tax I would have otherwise uh, paid immediately. Um, and if I hold it for three additional years or a total of 10 years, the new investment, I pay no future capital gains. So I know that's a lot, lot to say in one, uh, one breath, but let me give you a, a, a visual representation of that. So again, I sell a, an income property, my Apple stock, my Bitcoin collection, any, any capital gain that I trigger in 2019, I hold that for five years um, and I get a 10% step up in, in, in the, the tax basis. Um, I hold it for two more years or a total of seven years, I get an additional 5% or a total of 15%. At the end of 2026, so seven years from now, I will pay those taxes, technically April of uh, 2027, um, but I'm going to pay 85 cents uh, on the dollar. And you also think about it, I was also getting seven years um, worth of, of tax deferral, and I was also getting seven years, depending upon the investment, of, 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 of tax efficient income, especially if I had de depreciation offsets uh, for, for the new investment. Um, so I, I, rec I recognize my tax here, and in year, year 10 or 2029 in my example, um, if I sell my opportunity fund investment after that 10-year hold, I pay no taxes forever on the new investment. Um, one thing I want to add is, uh, again, I'm up here in Massachusetts, so uh, unfortunately Massachusetts is a non-conforming state. So even if I sell a property, invest the, the, the gains in an opportunity fund, uh, Massachusetts, among a handful of states, uh, does not recognize uh, the federal statute at this point. Uh, so you, you really need to look state by state um, to see if your state is a conforming state or not. So that would mean, in my case, we would have to pay the 5.2% state capital gains, uh, but we would still uh, defer and reduce all the other taxes that we talked about earlier. Um, so here's a, just a, a quick uh, example, kind of comparing a, uh, a let's call it a, a fully taxable investment versus a, a qualified opportunity fund. So in this example, um, it's a hundred thousand dollar capital gain um, using a 14% IRR internal rate of return on both the the taxable investment uh, as well as the opportunity fund. Uh, the tax assumption here, making up this 36 and a half percent tax. Uh, you can see in the footnote, it's it's 20% federal. Uh, this is using a, a, a New York example, 12.7%, uh, and then 3.8% is the net investment income tax. So that's where the 36%. So in the, the first example, I take my $100,000 gain. I have to pay my 36000 in taxes. I net $63,000. Um, I compound that out at 14% over 10 years, uh, which grows to $235,000. I pay tax on this new appreciation of 62,000, the same tax rate, and my after-tax available funds are 172,000 or 5.6% from where I started. On the uh, opportunity fund, the same 100,000, I'm not paying any tax upfront. I'm investing the 100,000, compounding at the same 14%, which grows after 10 years to, to uh, $370,000. I did have to, to pay my tax, 85 cents on the, on the dollar in, at the end of uh, year seven, 31,000 in this example. Um, and in this example, we also use uh, the, the value of the depreciation uh, pass-through to kind of uh, give an example of, of reinvesting in, in investment real estate. Uh, so you can see that the, the returns are, are quite significant with the tax benefits. Um, I think it's, it's worth taking a moment to just kind of point out a few comparisons between 1031 and qualified opportunity funds. Um, you know, again, uh, it's uh, the, 
in a 1031, it has to be a real property in a, in a qualified opportunity fund. It could be any capital gain, including investment property. Um, I don't need a, a QI in an opportunity fund exchange. I do in, in a 1031 exchange. Um, there is no 45-day deadline um, with an opportunity fund. There is with the 1031. Uh, in both instances, I have 120 days to um, tr make the transaction. Um, one thing uh, worth noting, too, on that 180 days, um, if I own a, 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 a property or a, an asset where I'm creating a capital gain in a, a pass-through structure such as a, a partnership, I actually get two bites of the apple because my, the partnership would have the 180-day window to, to execute an opportunity fund exchange. Um, if the, the partnership uh, at the partnership level de declines to do the exchange, then each individual partner would get a reset and have another 180 days to individually make it make an election. Um, so if I have a partner and they don't want to do an exchange, I do. So I really get um, a, a kind of a second second bite, which you don't you don't get that in a, in 1031. Um, someone asked me the other day, well, what? How does it, the government keep track of all this? Uh, there is a form for the opportunity fund, which is a 8949 which basically says I've, I've you know, created a gain I, and I've reinvested that gain within the 180-day window. Uh, so that's how they, they are, they're, they're tracking uh, this. And as mentioned before, for 1031s, it's um, 8824 uh, is, the, is the filing form. Um, so uh, maybe just to, to, to wrap up, um, uh, you know, a couple things I mentioned early on. Um, our view is that, you know, we want – uh, real estate professionals to be aware of this other form of of 1031 using uh, Delaware statutory trusts as well as kind of the planning opportunities that uh, opportunity funds um, uh, allow. Um, we've created uh, two different resource sites, uh, one for the, the DST 1031s uh, and the other just kind of reviewing some of the rules and regulations. We're constantly doing uh, webinars and, and, and speaking engagements to, to ed educate um, but right now, there's over 190 um, op qualified opportunity funds that have been filed with uh, the Treasury. Um, and so we've also created a platform to provide kind of a gateway and an, an ability to do some due diligence. Um, because again, uh, both DSTs and Ozone funds are typically Reg D offerings. Um, uh, so if, if someone, we're, we're also doing is if someone is looking for Triple net or fee simple real estate. That's uh, we're trying to drive pe people interested in 1031s uh, to um, Quantum's platform. Uh, and if someone is interested in a securitized form or needs to complement uh, to avoid boot uh, for a, a DST or Ozone in a securitized form, uh, we have a, a, a site for accredited investors that you can access through those those gateways. Um, with that, I think we're kind of running out of time. I'm going to just see if there's any other um, questions uh, posted. Uh, Julia or David, I'll, I'll, I'll turn it back to you and unless there's anything else. Well, that was uh, amazing. It's a lot to absorb and I'm glad that it's <laughs> being recorded because I think I'd have to watch this two or three times to, to take it all in. <clears throat> uh, and that is my next question is if somebody wanted to follow up with you directly, Kent, uh, here is your contact information for, uh, it's kaf at charles-river.com or 781-235-4417 is his phone number, extension 126. And of course you can read more about Kent and uh, all the services that they have to offer at uh, www.charles.com. Uh, dash river dot com. Uh, uh, that was amazing. So uh, you, you, you know, at the beginning, uh, and I actually can see all the initials uh, there. You know, it sounds like you spend a good part of your day not only educating others, but you know, getting educated yourself on on all this. And I'm sure the regulations, you know, are changing constantly. Also. Uh, you know, uh, how, how do you keep up with all this? <laughs> well, I think probably like a lot of the folks on, on the uh, webinar today, uh, just, uh, you know, are, are immersing ourselves in it. And we have a, 
a, a great network of a, attorneys and CPAs that uh, you know help you know form these funds. We've had some real estate folks that um, either have properties listed in opportunity zones or, or interested for, on behalf of their clients on how they would go about forming their own fund. Uh, so we've really tried to position ourselves as as a resource, and, and we got into this space because we had a number of uh, private clients that owned a significant amount of, of real estate, and we're looking for ways of diversifying, uh, not waiting till they passed away to get it to step up in basis, and the kids didn't want the real estate or, or the management responsibilities. So we think it's a great way of, of using this as a, as, a, as a planning tool to complement, you know, certainly the the real estate professionals um, focus. Yeah. And, and how do people go about finding the DSTs to invest in? Is it something they contact somebody like you about or is it they call their stock? Yeah, so, so, yeah great, great point. So, um, you, you know, you, you do have to have a securities license. Um, so not, not every uh, uh, person that has a securities license has the necessary license. You have to have, have either a, a series uh, seven or series 22. Um, not all uh, registered investment advisors or uh, broker dealers even, you know, have access to the marketplace. So I, I'd say it's really a, 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 a specialization that we've uh, focused on. And so we're trying to provide, you know, a level of, of, of due diligence. So there's right now there's about 38 sponsors that have um, DST offerings in the marketplace. Um, we probably only work with maybe 12 to possibly 15 that we, we we monitor on a regular basis because we we want to have ones that have the you know the management the experience the track record um, we're not looking for you know new startups uh, the the opportunity zone space uh, what I always tell people David is good good tax policy does not equal good investment so you know two guys with a pickup truck uh, that you know filed a, a form does not necessarily make a, a you know a healthy investment long term so. We want to have, um, you know, a vetting process, you know, to, for our, our clients. Okay. So let me ask you this. So say I was selling a interest in a limited partnership and I had money left you know, or money that I wanted to invest in something. So would that type of uh, money, would that be qualified to go into a DST? So um, yeah, two, two, two answers. So if the partnership is a, a, a real estate partnership and you're looking to do a, a 1031 exchange, then the answer would be yes, you know, a DST would be an eligible option within a 1031 exchange. If that partnership has nothing to do with real estate, so for example, I had a, a father-son recently that um, had a, a business together but also owned real estate. So we were talking about doing a, a 1031 exchange for some of the real estate aspect, but for the business itself, that's not eligible for 1031 exchange. Um, they were going to have a tremendous capital gain. Um, so we were able to carve out just the gain piece uh, for um, reinvestment in a qualified opportunity fund. Um, and actually that brings up one other last point I want to make too is with the qualified opportunity fund regulations, you can carve out and, 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 and reinvest just the gain and put all of your original basis back in your pocket uh, without triggering any tax, where in a 1031 exchange, you have to essentially exchange everything. So, so an opportunity fund allows you to, to, to take you know, monies off the table and just address just the gain portion uh, separately. Interesting. And you know, before you and I uh, had the conversation about three or four weeks ago, DSTs were not on my radar. I mean, I get lots of real estate publications. I read them, uh, you know, cover to cover usually. And yet DST somehow didn't uh, cross my brain pan. Uh, are they, you know, why, why do you think that is? I mean, why are, is, I mean, cause it sounds like a great vehicle. Uh, why do you think you know it hasn't really? I mean, opportunity zones are everywhere, and they get all the headlines. So yeah, why not the well, I think a lot of it is you know you know you're you're centered and focused in in the real estate community, and DSTs are only offered as you know through um, securities licensed individuals. Um, I guess where we see the overlap is you know firms like Cantor Fitzgerald and Inland, and uh, I don't know if Jones Lang LaSalle has a 
uh, a DFT. I know they actually have some opportunity funds, but um, a lot of those structures um, are, um, you know, the, the the, the distribution has to go through a, a licensed securities person. So I, that's probably why DSTs aren't, you know, front and center to the real estate professional, even though te- it's it's part of the 1031, you know, uh, regulation since 2004. Interesting. And so, you know, in the commercial real estate world, um, when people are, you know, making referrals of clients, you know, one to the other, there's often a referral fee. I know the securities world is very different. Uh, you know, if somebody out there in our audience today had a client who was interested in it and they wanted to refer them to you, uh, you know, is that something that is eligible for a referral fee to them or is that really just, um, uh, you know, thanks and I'll look for you down the road with, uh, you know, doing yeah, no, it, back. It, it, it's, it's a great question. So um, we we cannot pay any referral fees to any unlicensed, you know, un, non securities licensed individuals. So that you know, if, if it's directly related to the securities transaction, then that's not something that can be referred. Um, you know, I'm also you know a licensed uh, real estate uh, person. So there, there, if there's other transactions that can be uh, uh, you know, shared on the real estate and the pure real estate outside of uh, any securities transaction, then that's that's a, a way. And I think what we're trying to do through your your platform, your network, is drive awareness um, to you know 1031, which you know everyone on this call is familiar with 1031. But if we can bang the drum about how you know DSTs can can help um, create you know more transactions, more listings for realtors, um, and certainly a, lot, a number of the community that that we find some are not interested in, in, you know, a security, they want to still be a hands-on landlord and maybe they're looking for triple net property. Well, that's something that we can um, refer, you know, back to your community. So I think yeah. we're trying to, you know, kind of play our role, uh, create awareness uh, through, you know, uh, you know, all, all these types of uh, events and some of the marketing that we're doing to, to educate, you know, about both opportunity funds and how you can use them alongside with DSTs. Yeah. And, and that being said, I think uh, you know, commercial real estate broker can certainly build a lot of goodwill among their high net worth clients by letting them know that something like this exists, and uh, you know, goodwill goes a long way in this world. So uh, it's yeah, and, and I them. would say I mean, there are you know some brokers that you know uh, are kind of uh, lightly in this in this space, or they have very you know limited access to product or due diligence, so. It's like anything, um, you know, you want to work with someone that knows this space, has made a commitment to it, um, has, you know, access to, uh, you know, the inventory in the marketplace. So that's that's really what we're trying to position ourselves. Yeah. Uh, uh, well, I think uh, that is, you know, I mean, it was great education for me. Uh, we have a bunch of people here. I would love to see if anybody else out there has a question, especially all those well-educated CCIMs who, who are uh, on the webinar today. Uh, I'm curious, you know, at, at the CCIM training that you've gotten, uh, have you been hearing much about uh, DSTs and the oper- qualified opportunity funds? Uh, if you don't want to unmute yourself, please put it uh, right there in the, the chat box. Uh, I'm very curious as to see what the level of education uh, is out there at this point. Yeah, and Dave, if anything comes up after the call, um, we can certainly you know respond to questions and, and, and share that with anyone that logged on to the webinar as well. Terrific. I think we have a, a shy crowd here. I'll give them another moment. Uh, well, they're, they're probably still trying to digest. I talk very fast. So. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we have a question here. David, uh, um, I don't want to mispronounce your last name. Uh, David uh, says DSTs are available if you search for them. Yeah, there's a couple of books on Amazon um, uh, You know that we'll talk about. Uh, uh, Delaware Statutory Trust. You know, hopefully, I gave you the the tops of the trees uh, version of that. But you know, we can also provide any additional resources. Or um, again, if if you visit uh, the, the the site that I shared before, um, we just back up two screens. 
you know, this is kind of a generic, two, two, two different generic sites about it, but this, if someone is a accredited investor and they're interested in learning more about, you know, what types of properties or investments are out there, um, they will get uh, access to the, um, uh, what we call our, our marketplace or our exchange hub, which will list all the details, um, you know, brochures, pec prospectus, uh, you know, video overviews of the properties. Um, and it's changing, it changes literally daily uh, because the marketplace changes quickly. I know that um, Inland just closed on a, a, a $250 million uh, project. And so the, the investors coming out of those um, investors that went full cycle are typically looking to do an, a 1031 exchange into another DST. So the, the marketplace uh, kind of moves quickly. Excellent. And our uh, guest Kamal says, as a keynote speaker and CCIM member, I addressed the subject last October at the National CCIM Conference in Chicago. Excellent. Excellent. Good. Good. Kamal, is there anything that you want to add about uh, DSTs and uh, Qualified Opportunity Zone funds? You feel free to unmute yourself, uh, or I can unmute you if you need help with that. Hear somebody typing. That's okay. I did put in the chat box um, what Kent mentioned. You can text top ten re to four four two 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 to get his uh, PDF. And I already downloaded it and I'm looking at it. It's great. So it's top ten re the, the number one zero um, to four four two two two. Thank you, Julia. Okay, well, I think I'm going to pause the recording. Uh, if somebody does ask another